Hi there guys, and welcome to the latest episode of the Cryptoverse, which is your regular dose of news and commentary on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and blockchains. My name is Chris Coney, and I am the host of the Cryptoverse and the founder of Cryptoversity.com, which is the online school where you set the price to learn about Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and blockchains. And you can find out more about Cryptoversity by going to Cryptoversity.com. So let us begin by looking at the overall markets. And I do this unprepared so that I can give you my thoughts off the top of my head. And we've gone up in overall market cap today. This is the overall market cap according to coinmarketcap.com and the whole sphere, uh, the whole cryptoverse, all coins added together. And uh, the total market cap is th just over $13 billion. And that has gone up slightly from yesterday. And that's the number I always like to see increasing so I can see um, sort of that's one of my indicators of how crypto is being adopted because more and more value is flowing into cryptocurrencies. Steam has gained 18% in the last 24 hours. And that's after a couple of days of it, it went up massively at the end of last week. Then it had a couple of down days in the 10% range. And now it's gone up 18%. So it had a it had a, um, a minor security issue, and then it had a denial of service attack. But inevitably, the way that the um, developers respond to these kinds of things speak volumes, and I believe they've handled it quite well. And you can you can check check that out if you Google uh, Steam it hack or something like that. So I'm sure you'll find something. It wasn't Steam wasn't hacked though. That's the thing. The blockchain was fine. There was a browser based vulnerability. Um, which, you know, is, is a user, is a security issue on the user's end, but they've done something about it anyway. And then they also had a denial of service attack, which is, um, again, difficult to avoid. Um, it's, it's more of a, you have to prepare infrastructure for that kind of thing. So I was thinking about doing a, a YouTube video on, on DDoS, which is a distributed denial of service attack just explaining to the community what the hell that means. All right, Nemcoin sitting pretty at seventh position in overall market cap, has lost 9%. Anybody else doing anything big today? Peercoin down 11%. It was a big up day for Peercoin yesterday, but uh, Steam is the biggest winner today. And it's actually, that's $2 million worth of trading volume. That's the most I've ever seen on Steam. So let's go over to <clears throat> Bitcoin's price chart. Bitcoin sitting at $672, pretty stable over the last few days. And it's everything's returned sort of quote to normal. The size of the moves every day is back to the, you know, one or two or two and a half percent per day mark. So that's pretty nice. Stability is good. I mean, a, a gentle, a gentle move up in the Bitcoin price as adoption increases is cool. Um, but these, these wild swings, they cause the biggest problem for companies who are, who are um, or businesses whose businesses are based on Bitcoin transactions, especially if they are transacting back and forth to fiat, because that's uh, where the problem is if the price is all over the place. All right, for the news article today, I'm not bringing you an article from Bitcoin.com as I usually would. I'm bringing you an article from Coindesk.com because they published this article uh, yesterday late on yesterday, 8 p.m. Uh, in UK time. And it's a, it's an article that says that the, the hard fork, what's about to happen to Ethereum and the DAO. Now, because this is such a hot topic, I uh, figured the community at large would appreciate knowing about this more than anything else. So I've used my own discretion. Now, I've used quite an interesting image at the top of the article. It's four pencils. And uh, one of the, well, it's actually five pencils, and the fourth one is turned upside down. So instead of seeing the tip of the pencil, the fourth one is turned upside down so you can see the eraser. And uh, that's kind of uh, kind of funny because the hard fork in the Ethereum network is basically going to erase uh, the stolen funds that uh, the attacker stole. So here we go then. <clears throat> Last month, an unknown attacker drained tens of millions of dollars 
worth of digital currency Ether from the DAO, an Ethereum-based smart contract aimed at functioning as a funding vehicle for projects in the ecosystem. The incident sparked an effort to effectively roll back the clock and undo much of the damage, a process that comes to a head this week as network-wide changes are set to be rolled out. For weeks, the impact has been largely confined to pages of social media, and for developers, within the workspaces and private chats, of those most closely involved with the so-called hard fork effort. Now, however, with code for the changes completed and merged with major wallet implementations, that's about to change. Major exchanges that offer trading services for Ether have announced their plans to support the fork in the past few days. Generally speaking, the plan is to support the strongest blockchain, which will be determined by how much hashing power it draws from Ethereum's distributed network of miners. So far, digital currency exchanges Poloniex and Kraken, which comprise more than 50% of all Ether trading volumes, have said they plan to briefly suspend deposits and withdrawals prior to the fork activation. Miners, si miners signs indicate, have largely moved to adopt the hard fork measures, with major pool operators looking to their members to assess support for the plan, even if reluctantly. The stakes on the outcome of the vote are high. If the hard fork fails to be implemented, many early adopters of Ethereum who purchased DAO tokens, meant to give them voting rights in the new organization, will be out $60 million worth of cryptocurrency, increasing concerns about potential regulatory involvement. On the other hand, if the hard fork is implemented, the Ethereum blockchain, which is supposed to be an unchangeable record of all transactions, will no longer be seen as immutable. In sense, in essence, code may no longer be law. <clears throat> so how we got here? For those who may be unfamiliar with the DAO, here's a quick recap of the story so far. Launched in April, the DAO was designed as a series of contracts that would raise funds for Ethereum-based projects and disperse them based on the votes from members. An initial token offering was conducted, exchange, uh, sorry, exchanging Ethers for DAO tokens that would allow stakeholders to vote on proposals, including ones to grant funding to a particular project. That token offering raised more than $150 million worth of Ether at then current prices. Uh, distributing over 1 billion DAO tokens. Just over a month ago, however, news broke that a flaw in the DAO's smart contract had been exploited, allowing the removal of more than 3 million Ether, or Ethers. Subsequent exploits allowed for more funds to be removed, which ultimately triggered a white hat effort by token holders to secure the remaining funds. That in turn triggered uh, reprisals from others seeking to exploit the same flaw. An effort to blacklist certain addresses tied to the DAO, or tied to the DAO attackers, was also stymied mid rollout after researchers identified a security vulnerability, thus forcing the hard fork option. How the hard fork works. Much has been said about the Ethereum hard fork and the idea that it constitutes a rollback of the network. While not necessarily false, the specifics of the hard fork proposal on the table are a bit more complicated. Here's how. The proposal doesn't exactly unwind the network's transaction history. Rather, it relocates the funds tied to the DAO to a new smart contract with a single purpose of letting the original owners withdraw them. According to a recent blog post explaining the move, DAO token holders will be able to withdraw Ether at a rate of 1 Ether to 100 DAO. The extra balance and any Ether that remains as a result of the re-entrancy exploit and the splitting mechanism will be withdrawn and distributed by the DAO curators or individuals selected prior to the collapse of the DAO to provide a fail-safe protection for the organization. As part of an effort to ensure that the hard fork doesn't also include new vulnerabilities, Ethereum co-founder Jeff Wilk, Jeff Wilk 
also announced a bounty program for those who test the hard fork code and coders earn rewards based on vulnerabilities they discover in the code. Miners make their pitch. By Friday, major mining pools in the Ethereum network had begun to open up voluntary voting to gauge their contributors' interest on how to handle the hard fork. Pools measured sentiment by way of hash rate rather than individual miner accounts. Though support by the miners doesn't seem to swing towards the hard fork, it does seem to swing towards the hard fork, low turnout has opened the door to criticism that the vote wasn't representative of the entire network. At least one large mining pool said it would only begrudgingly honour the fork. Pools like Dwarf Pool, which possesses about a quarter of the network's total hash power, held a vote in which a majority of participants indicated their support. However, less than 7% of Dwarf Pool's hash rate was accounted for in their vote. 14% of Ethermine's hash rate voted in a similar poll, with a clear majority of those voting in support of the hard fork. 23% of Etherpool's mining power voted, with a slim majority moving against the hard fork. Other miners, including F2 Pool, which operates a major Bitcoin mining pool, suggested a degree of apprehension about the hard fork. The, because the oh, sorry, they suggested a degree of apprehension about the hard fork plan, but indicated that it would likely support it. And the pool said in a statement, quote, We are, as a matter of principle, against unduly rushed or controversial hard forks irrespective of the team proposing it, and we will not run such code on production systems nor mine any block from that hard fork. I believe this is universal, and it could be applied to Ethereum too. I fail to see why we must take such a controversial and risky hard fork. We are not willing to deploy this hard fork unless we have to. Well, my comment there is that um, my stance on this personally, guys, is is my stance is controversial because it's um, it basically goes like this. We should let the attacker keep the money. That's basically my stance. And you say, well, why? Well, because if we are going to move into a world of smart contracts, then code is, is law. And that is the rule of law. And better yet, anyone who... Um, I, I believe people can understand or can learn to... Uh, can learn to code a lot easier than they can they can learn to become a lawyer right so i believe that code should become a rule of law in smart contracts now supposedly and no one's verified this for sure but the dow attacker put out a letter basically saying that they read the contract i.e they read the code and the quote the so-called exploit wasn't an exploit at all it was perfectly legal under the terms of the contract because it was allowed by the code, right? And this is the beautiful thing about smart contracts is the reason we have a court system is that once something is written into law, it's not a hard and fast rule because if someone then violates that law, you have to have a judge who, or a court system that interprets, you know, what the law means in that situation. Um, because you can't obviously can't account for all possible um, environments under which the law will be broken or not. The difference with smart contracts is that you can do that. You can write test harnesses in code. You can run all possible inputs through a smart contract to test what uh, will happen in any situation. Now, that's not actually fair. That's not actually true. You cannot test every possible combination of inputs. So I'll retract that. Um, but it's it's a lot more thorough than trying to do it with with law in human brains, right? Anyway, long story short, I believe that they should just leave it as it is. Yeah, I believe that the Dow attacker kind of was in his within his rights um, to use the terms of the contracts to withdraw the funds. Now, that's not I don't agree with it on an ethical or moral level, but on a principle level, and 
looking at how what the impact of this will be if they do hard fork, it's just not good. And then if you say, well, what about all the people that have uh, gonna lose their funds? Well, I say that's that comes with the territory. I've invested in many things and I've lost money in them, but I didn't I, I didn't cry about it because I operate on a principle that you should never invest more than you can afford to lose. And that's the biggest problem I see with um, these crowd funds in the cryptocurrency space is that a lot of amateur investors are participating in them that don't understand what they're doing. They don't understand these principles like never invest more than you can afford to lose um, and so on and so on and so on. It comes down to people taking responsibility for their for their actions. And people would say, well, if I knew I was going to lose the money, I would have invested it. Well, then you'd never invest then, would you? Because d no investment is 100% guaranteed safe, right? So you have to base it on that principle that you should never invest more than you can afford to lose. And the way you make money investing is you invest in, in lots of different things. You cut your, cut your money up into 100 pieces, say, invest it in 100 different things. And then as long as Say, say if 20, 20 of those goes bust, as long as you make enough money on the other 80 to make up for it and then turn a profit, that is actually how you make money in investing. Not every investment gives a return. You get a good return on the ones that do to make up for the ones that you lose on. And that's just a principle. And if you don't have that level of education, then of course, when something goes wrong, you're going to ask someone to bail you out like a hard fork. Anyway, that's just my take on it. So let's just finish the article. One more section left. Exchanges make their own plans. The fork is scheduled to kick in at block 1,920,000. Estimated to take place sometime around the 21st of July, which will limit the amount of time Ether exchanges like Poloniex, Bitfinex, and Kraken have to implement their plans. That's another thing. These guys haven't done anything wrong. The Poloniexes, the exchanges, the wallet providers, all these guys that are being asked to implement this code, it's just a royal inconvenience for them because they have to do all this work and they're not getting paid for it. And they had nothing to do with the creation of the problem, which is, I think that's wholly unfair. They were just going about their business, right? Doing their thing. Anyway, in a blog post, Poloniex said it would it will temporarily disable deposits and withdrawals from an unspecified length of time leading up to the migration process. Quote, once the network is stable and the migration is complete, complete, we will enable deposits and withdrawals, the post said. In an email Friday, Kraken said it intends to disable withdrawals on the 19th of July, approximately one hour before the hard fork activates. Trading will function as normal during the fork and all ether on Kraken after the fork will be tokens of the chain with the most number of miners working on it. Early reports that withdrawals will also be closed for one hour after the hard fork are untrue, according to a representative of Kraken speaking to Coindesk. From the email, quote, Ether deposits and withdrawals will be enabled again once the winning chain has become clearly evident. We expect the hard fork process to be smooth and quick, but there is no certainty of this. Close quote. In this statement, Bitfinex largely echoed Poloniex and Kraken, declaring its intention to support the strongest change. The exchange said in a blog post, quote, We will re-enable deposits and withdrawals when we are confident that the longest valid chain has been clearly indicated. During this time, exchange trading, margin trading, and margin funding will all continue to operate as normal. And that is the end of the article. I guess the key question that they can't answer, which we would like to know the answer to, is how do you know when, um, like these quotes say, when the winning chain has become clearly evident? Well, how will you know? How will you know when the winning chain has become clearly evident? You know, that's um, it's a bit ambiguous, isn't it? I, I mean, maybe they can't say. I don't really know. They probably can say. Um... Hmm. I don't know. I I am not a mining expert, so I can't really say with any sort of authority. Okay, two people have commented. Um, oh, this this user called Bitfreak has commented saying, 
my last post got deleted by the powers that are here. And then he's commented again saying, I assume comments are disabled for me here. What did I do wrong? Well, that's interesting. Well, that doesn't bode well for me. I mean, this is the first article that I've featured from Coindesk uh, on the Cryptoverse. And if they go about censoring people's comments, then that's going to discourage me from from uh, featuring their stuff. The very reason why I chose Bitcoin.com in the first place as the main source of news was because of the philosophy behind how it started. It was be it was because there was um, censorship happening on, I think it was the Bitcoin talk forums that Roger Veer was like, we can't have this. So we went off and set up Bitcoin.com and the forums at Bitcoin.com as a censorship free place to express yourself in the in the Bitcoin industry, right? Um, it's a shame, really, that that kind of thing happens. You would think people interested in these decentralized, transparent, you know, blockchains and stuff that bring liberty to people would uh, would stay true to those principles. However, you can never keep anything 100% clean. The bad guys will get in there and try and use it to their own personal gain. But that's okay. That's okay. Because as long as as long as fundamentally the system we're working on, like blockchains, decentralized consensus and all this sort of stuff, that's the thing that's going to win the day. So if a few people do creep in, a few uh, Trojan horses creep in, people I'm talking about, not Trojan horses into actual code, because that would not be good. Yeah, as long as a few bad actors come in, that's okay. We just got to deal with that. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the Cryptoverse. If you would like to go to cryptoversity.com forward slash podcast, you can subscribe on YouTube or on the Google Play Store, Stitcher or iTunes. You can also check out the Cryptoverse on Steemit. If you just go to steemit.com, use the search feature and type in the Cryptoverse, you'll see all the episodes appear. The other reason I'd like you to go to Steemit is that if you want to support the Cryptoverse, Go to Steam it, find it, find the article, and then, well, this article, and then upvote it. Because if you upvote it, that provides funding to make the, the Cryptoverse continue and be able to pay its bills. Also, remember to check out the main site, Cryptoversity.com, where you set the price to learn about Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and blockchains. That's all for today, guys. So it's me, Chris Coney, saying bye for now.